Welcome to Direct Approach with Wayne Moorhead, an exclusive podcast brought to you by Direct Selling News. Host Wayne Moorhead interviews some of the leading marketers and innovators in direct selling to help your marketing and branding teams motivate the field, engage customers, and further your brand's reach and impact. In today's episode, Wayne is joined by Danny Lee, President and CEO of For Life. After graduating magna cum laude from the University of Utah with dual degrees in accounting and finance, Danny moved to Silicon Valley. From there, he returned to Utah to work for Overstock.com. In 2008, Danny became a part of the direct selling family when he became For Life Research Chief Operations Officer. In 2016, he became Chief Marketing Officer and in 2018 was appointed President and CEO. Danny and Wayne take a deep dive into For Life's retail pricing strategy and how their approach turned the Amazon challenge from the elephant in the room to a positive piece of the business that benefits everyone. If you are looking for a solution on how to manage Amazon from a compliance standpoint and how to keep it a win-win for corporate and field, this is the episode for you. Danny will also share insights and lessons from For Life's recent brand refresh. You'll get some invaluable takeaways on the process and the principles behind updating your brand the right way. And you don't want to miss his thoughts on where and how to best spend your marketing budget. But before we dive in, let's hear a word from our sponsor. The influence of social media is undeniable. On average, people spend over two hours a day connecting with family, friends, and brands across social media. But did you know that it's also the way that most consumers prefer to discover new products? In fact, over 60% of people say they discover new products on Instagram. Additionally, Forbes reports that 78% of salespeople using social selling outsell their peers. To compete in today's marketplace, you must capitalize on your most valuable asset, your social media influencers. Introducing Now Social, the smartest way to effectively grow and monetize your network. Just as we revolutionize the way distributors share content, offer samples, and sell products, we're now bringing the same innovation to social selling. Now Social simplifies the process of creating and scheduling content and allows you to manage posts and engagements across all platforms. And even if your distributors have never attempted social selling before, Now Social empowers anyone in your field to become a successful micro influencer. As more and more consumers turn to social media to connect with brands and discover new products, it's more important than ever to have the most effective social selling strategy. What are you waiting for? Your time is now. Now, please help me welcome your host, Wayne Moorhead, and today's guest, Danny Lee, President and CEO of For Life. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of DSN's Direct Approach Podcast. I'm your host, Wayne Moorhead, and very excited to be joined today by For Life's President and CEO, Danny Lee. Danny, thanks for joining us today. Hey, it's good to be here, Wayne. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. I've been listening to the podcast. When I have an opportunity to, and I know a lot of people here for life have as well. It's a big hit and uh, it's an honor being invited to be a guest. So thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and, and appreciate listening again. You know, we're, we're all learning, um, you know, on each one of these podcasts, I've learned so much and, and have a notebook full of notes uh, that I, that I reference and go back to. So I selfishly, you know, love doing it and, and love learning from each of the executives. And I'm excited to have a new chapter on the Danny Lee notes you know, included in that notebook. So <laughs> excited to dig in with you. Good, as am I. Well, you've had a really impressive uh, career, again, starting outside of direct selling, uh, like many of us have. Um, but you've worked for, you know, well-known management consulting firms, well-known online retailers. Um, you know, without stealing too much of your thunder, can you tell us a little bit about the path that led you into direct selling and into For Life? Yeah, absolutely. Not sure how exciting it is, but uh, I'd have to go back probably to my the summer between my junior and senior year in high school. I had a friend in my neighborhood, an adult who was kind of looking after me, probably in hindsight, trying to keep me out of trouble that summer. He got me a job at, at the corporate offices of Mrs. Fields Cookies, where he was the controller and he picked me up every day and in the morning. And there were some mornings where I'm like, what am I doing here? But 
it was it was um, that guy who ended up being a, a real mentor for me in my career. And I met also at that time a gentleman named Steve too, who uh, ended up being uh, the president of For Life when I arrived here. So I so as a junior, I, I was meeting people in in this in my career that would end up influencing me here to this day. So, but for Mrs. Fields, I, I also worked at Merrill Lynch for a stint there when I was in college and. And then out of college, uh, I graduated from, from the University of Utah in accounting and finance, and then went out to Silicon Valley where I worked with Arthur Anderson, um, consulting and auditing in the in the tech world, right? Uh, software, hardware. It was an exciting time. It was right during the dot-com bubble and burst. So I was out there for that. And I was, I was actually with Anderson when the whole Enron thing um, went oh, down. Wow. So, so it was an exciting time for me, kind of a scary time for me. Um, but I, it, it forced me out of public accounting and consulting at that time and back into you know, the private side of business where I came back to Utah and jumped on with Overstock.com and they were just about to go public. So they're looking to beef up their finance team. So we took Overstock public back in those days and, and raised some money subsequent to that and got some great experience in the finance world. But then the CEO of, of, of Overstock, Patrick Byrne, he pulled me out of finance and said, hey, we, we, we don't want you playing referee. We want you catching touchdowns. And so he he got me into the operating side of things. And I, I served in merchandising and purchasing customer service and really came to love you know, that side of the business, but have always kept my roots and, and you know appreciate what I learned in accounting and finance. So from Overstock, I, I left there and was interviewing a couple of places, and including Amazon. And this was an exciting time in the world of, of that space, e-commerce, and but ended up coming back and meeting with the guys I, I met and worked with at Mrs. Fields all those many years ago. They had an opportunity for me, and I said, yeah, I'll come have lunch with you. And, and the opportunity was at a different company, a book company here locally, and be the CFO. And after meeting with them, I, I got a call back and they said, hey, um, how do you feel about working at For Life? I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. You know, like, sounds good. You guys are there. So um, I, I admit I was a little hesitant, you know, direct selling. I, I had thoughts about that and maybe some misconceptions, even though my mom throughout all my childhood was totally involved in a lot of direct selling companies and, and it helped us quite a bit as a family. Um, but knowing that they were there and that they were men of integrity and great businessmen and business minds, I'm like, yeah, let's do this. And so uh, that's how I ended up at Four Life. That's my that's my that's my story. That's really cool. Again, you know, very impressive background. And you know, it sounds like you were you know having you had a front row seat to some pretty historic events in the business world, um, which is pretty amazing. And you know, I, I came out of college um, during the the first kind of dot com boom, you know, right before the bubble. You know, about a year and a half before the bubble. So. Um, I know what it's like to be at a company that's like, you know, 200 people when you join and there's 20 of you when the doors close, you know, after, after the bubble uh, burst. But again, you know, really interesting time to, to be jumping in. So, you know, my guess is we're, we're probably pretty close to the, you know, the same age, probably graduated college, you know, roughly about the same time if, if you came out during that same time period. Um, I also thought it was really interesting where you mentioned that some of those relationships and those introductions from earlier, you know, in the, in the early days during college, that they would come back and, and, you know, prove to be really beneficial in the business world. And I know that's been, been really true for me, you know, every, probably every job and every opportunity um, that's ever come to me has come through a friend, somebody in my network. So again, I feel very fortunate to have, you know, really wonderful friends that, that continue to look out for me and look out for others. But uh, that had to be pretty interesting to, to watch, you know, those introductions and those relationships, you know, come to fruition down the road. I, I agree, Wayne. It's been key for me, and and that particular gentleman, uh, you know, Mark Osler, He's he, he helped me get my job at Anderson, in fact, and and he was he's always been a strong advocate for me. And me, naturally being an introvert, I'm not a, a, a natural networker. I don't just reach out to people proactively all the time. And so it was important to have a mentor and a friend like that in my career. But and I've had others, especially after Enron, and I everybody's looking to jump ship, and I I was one of the, those few who made it past all those rounds of layoffs down in, in, in our Silicon Valley office and people were going to different firms and that that's was looking like what I was going to do. I had a friend who took me to his firm, introduced me to all these people. And even though I didn't end up going there, I think he was with Price Waterhouse, maybe 
I, I just thought, man, what he's doing for me today, I don't know if I can ever pay him back, but I tried to, and he ended up, he ended up in, in our industry, in fact. And so oh, interesting. Um, I was able to just, just, you know, take that approach and just think, I always want to be helpful to people. And that's what I love about this industry. It's, it's actually surprising how open and, and sharing everybody is with, with their successes, their failures, what to do uh, and what not to do. And so that's another reason why, you know, I'm happy to do this podcast. I hope I can share something today that's helpful to the people listening. Yeah, absolutely. Again, yeah, maintain those relationships, friendships, you know, never burn any bridges. You know, that, that's some advice that, you know, someone had given me a long time ago. And again, just just fortunate that it seems like, you know, in, in networks, we're able to to help each other out when there's a, a role that we know of um, with a skill set that, that one of our friends or associates have. It, it's great to be able to reach out and, and kind of vice versa. So you, you spent time again, you've, you've had, um, you know, an interesting aspect of your career is that you've had a lot of different roles and a lot of different functions. You know, it hasn't just been this, hey, I'm, I'm in the CFO lane. You know, you've gone from, you know, operations to marketing. Um, and you spent time, again, at one of the largest, you know, most well-known online retailers. What are some of the learnings that you were able to gain from, you know, that, that really consumer marketing focused company that you were able to bring into direct selling? Yeah, um, you're right, Wayne. I, I've had the opportunity, like you said, but getting out of that CFO lane was actually difficult, it, you know, emotionally, mentally, because that was my whole track, right? You look at my resume and you look at my education. I was a, a CPA, a, you know, assistant controller, cro- controller, VP of finance. And when I was asked, even in the same company, to go and do something different, I just thought, what is this going to do to my career? How am I ever going to, you know, survive in, the, in this world? But I, I bring that up only to say that you can. You know, people, you can, you can jump over to other disciplines. And then, in fact, if you have the opportunity, I would say, you know, take courage and do it because you'll learn so much more. You'll stay engaged. You'll be, you'll, you'll add more skills to, to the toolbox and it'll just be, it'll be a great thing. But at Overstock, you know, as, as I feel like I was just a young kid at the time, I was, I was in my twenties and, but I again, had a great seat. I was at the executive table at a very early age there and was able to see lots of cool things. And that was just the emergence of e-commerce at the time. And it was an exciting world, you know, and there's no sales tax and, and Amazon was starting to do their thing and they're getting, getting pretty big. And we thought we had a shot at taking them on. And, and we learned we, we, we really didn't uh, over time, but, uh, but Overstock it was a great proving ground and, and, and experience for me, taking the company public, um, learning about payments, um, learning this whole world of, of, you know, this digital marketing world, looking at heat maps and email campaigns, click through rates, rates, conversions, streamlining that checkout process, understanding the importance of all of that, free shipping, even way back then, you know, over 20 years ago was, was, was a big thing or, or, you know, free shipping days, it was, it was just like crack. These people would come back, they'd wait for free shipping days and then we'd have a rush of sales come in. And But we, we were growing and there was hyper growth. And so it was an awesome, awesome time to, to be a part of a company like that uh, on what I would call that new frontier of, of e-commerce. And now look what's happened. Look at our daily lives. If, if, you, don't, if you don't have an Amazon package showing up to your door today, you know, something's wrong, um, you know, your spouse must be out of town or your kids must not have needed something. But, um, you know, that that's just the world that we live in now. But also at Overstock, even back then, I, I learned about the debate that between that traditional you know, branding, do we do Super Bowl ads or do we put our money into digital marketing? You know, in digital marketing, we can measure all of our outputs and, and our gains and, and, and how profitable we are with these campaigns. It was revolutionary. And yet still there was this pull towards traditional branding and advertising. You know, hey, we, did, we got a deal on a Super Bowl ad, a 30-second spot, a discount price, let's take it. Well, no, we shouldn't take it. We'll never know, you know, if it's profitable. It makes no sense in this new world. So it was, it was a fun time to be a part of an e-commerce company like Overstock, which is still thriving to this day. That's really interesting. Again, I think your varied experience has given you a really unique perspective and prepared you probably for the role that you're in today, that you can be more empathetic, um, you know, to the other people uh, in the C-suite that are, you know, to the right of you and the left of you, you know, at that board table. Um, And again, having that, you know, consulting experience and also into the, you know, the burgeoning digital 
Um, and I've been, I've, I've had that debate. I've been on, uh, you know, toe to toe on the, on the, you know, top of funnel, you know, bottom of the funnel conversion advertising. Um, and it's tough. It, it's something that we all need to consider. And, and I think it's incumbent on the people doing the brand marketing uh, to really measure and prove the value uh, that they're adding, that they are helping to prospect, that they are helping to fill the funnel. Um, that without that, you know, then you're just transactional. You're not establishing a long-term relationship with a brand um, and a company, but that kind of higher level brand marketing is there to establish the emotional connection, you know, to help with loyalty, to help with awareness. Uh, but yeah, it's still to this day, it's, it's not, it's not a fun argument and it's still being had right now, but a uh, great learning experience for sure. Yeah. I, I, my background again is in accounting and finances. So, and I'm a pretty pragmatic guy. I just, you know, I love the numbers of the data. It's nice to be able to prove something out with facts and, and it's hard to do that when it comes to branding, but I recognize that branding is, is real. Brand equity is something that is real and, and, it's just hard to measure. That's that's the biggest challenge, and it's hard to yeah. know how many resources to allocate to that particular e endeavor. So it's a great debate. It's a debate that uh, will continue on even here at For Life, and uh, it's fun. It's fun. Uh, uh, it is. It is. And again, it, I think it's up to the marketers um, to be able to really prove their value um, and to and to be able to report those results. Again, I was at a D 2 C really kind of fast growing D2C company that was experiencing hyper growth. And, and we would meet literally daily and weekly with the CFO on our budget, on our ad budget, on results um, to be accountable. We, you know, we didn't raise any money. We had bootstrapped and, and those, um, those meetings with the CFO and kind of that collaboration was amazing. I, I'd never had that as closely um, before, but when you're both on the same team, then it's really easy to, you know, to get budgets approved and to be able to, you know, increase and throttle ad spend up and down because it's based on real numbers. You've got the backing um, of the CFO and you're collaborating with it where, again, a lot of the times I feel like there's a natural tension between, you know, either a marketing or a sales group and, you know, either the on the legal side or the finance side. But once you can establish that really tight relationship, I think amazing things can happen. I, I agree. And and again, back then it was, do we spend 2 million bucks on a Super Bowl spot and watch our traffic spike and really never know, yeah. you know how many residual sales we're going to get from that? Or do we you know spend all of that on on discrete and focused targeted campaigns through all of the, uh, you know, at the time, Yahoo, MSN, what what have you. In our industry, with 4Life today, some of that debate um, is on a large international convention, for example, where you spend mm -hmm. millions of dollars for an event uh, that you nowadays you can do virtually and, and save millions of dollars and still have the same audience size, but are you losing something in terms of an emotional impact and connection, sure. real branding or a real experience that that lends really strongly towards loyalty and long-term commitment to, to a brand? And so, again, that debate continues and I, I'm sure is alive and well in many of the companies in this industry today. Yeah, I've had those same discussions, you know, in-house and, you know, I think the answer always ends up kind of gravitating somewhere to the middle. Um, you know, I, I think that those, you know, close person to person relationships are necessary. I think we were all super excited um, when we saw, you know, the, the numbers from a reach standpoint, you know, with our first virtual convention, oh, look, we saved, you know, $12 million, $15 million, and yet we, you know, 10xed the audience that we reached. How can we ever... Um, you know, justify putting the dollars back. But then when events started happening in person again, and, you know, those connections with the field um, were being reestablished, we quickly saw the importance of, of both. So I, I think it's going to, it's a little bit and not or is going to be the, where it kind of ultimately lands. But yeah, really interesting discussions. And I'm excited to see kind of what that ratio and what that mix ends up being. Absolutely. As are we. Well, I want to shift into to kind of an interesting topic, something that I know that you talk a lot about it for life and doesn't get talked about often. And that's really getting into pricing strategy, your pricing structure, and, and, and more specifically, um, some of your thoughts around retail pricing. I, I feel like sometimes internally, you know, that can be a little bit of an afterthought. It's a number that just gets, you know, thrown on the, the PDP on the website. Um, but you're like, well, no one's really going to buy at that. So why do we even have it? You know, um, I, I'm really interested. You've, you've been very thoughtful and very strategic about your pricing strategy and structure. 
Um, and I'd love to know kind of your views on that relationship between, you know, the price value equation, you know, brand equity, retail, wholesale pricing, like what are the role of these elements in kind of demonstrating that value to the end consumer? Yeah, uh, thanks, Wayne. It, it is something that I've thought a lot about and admittedly didn't, did not think a lot about until I got into this role as president and CEO of For Life. I, I guess as the chief marketing officer is the first time I, I, I was looking at our, our product catalog and there was no pricing in one of them. I was just like, how can you have no pricing? And um, it just felt like this is a major part of what we're supposed to do, especially if we're you know, now we're more focused than ever in direct selling about customer acquisition. And, and for the average person, you know, that, that's, a, that's a really big deal. When you're looking at buying a product, you know, price is one of the key features of that. You know, there's quality, there, there's service element, and, and there's other aspects that, that are strongly considered. But price is one of the, if not the most important piece of, of that decision. And so... I think this whole premise of, of brand equity and the pricing strategy for us at Poor Life has been built on what I call this 95-5 rule. Um, I, I, I've heard it, I've heard it said, I, I don't know where it came from, but I tended to believe it, that out of 100 people, if you talk to somebody about a direct selling opportunity, 95 of those people are not going to have any interest at all in that, what we call financial opportunity in this industry probably five of them would, would be very interested. But of those 95, all of them are interested in a great product with a great value, right? And so that, that we can't dismiss that. We can't dismiss those people. And one of the best things about our industry are, are the fantastic products that we do have. And, and we feel the exact same way about our products at Four Life. You know, we are the immune system company. We have products that we think are second to none. So how do we attract and, and not ignore those 95 people that, that have no interest in being um, part of a financial opportunity. In fact, they might be turned off by what they view as some type of attachment that they don't want to be um, associated with, uh, with a particular company, brand, or person. And so we, we have to accept this reality in today's world that Amazon does exist. Walmart.com exists. eBay exists. Um, Mercado Libre exists in Latin America, you know, Taobao and, and these other these other online platforms, they exist and they are the mothership. They are the 800 pound gorilla. They are the marketplace in today's world. And, and we we are there. <laughs> tell me, tell me a direct selling company who doesn't have products on these platforms. Everybody does. And so the question is, are you going to just be passive? And stick your head in the sand and just hope for the best, or are you going to run to those those theaters of war, if you will, and establish your brand and protect your brand and establish your price? And so, for these ninety five people out there that are interested in a great product but maybe don't want to have anything to do with you, we at Four Life feel like a retail price is critical to that strategy. Okay, you want our product? Great, we want you to have it. You don't want any attachment. You don't want to be a preferred customer. You don't want to enroll. None of that. Awesome. You can find our product. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it on forelife.com. You can walk into any one of our stores all throughout the world, and you can have that product, but at our highest price, at our retail price. So it's, so. what good is a wholesale price, Wayne, that you're offering to all of your affiliates or preferred customers if there really is no retail price? I mean, if a retail price is, as you said, just window dressing and no one ever buys at that price, then it really has no meaning at all. And there's no value in the wholesale price. So it's critical not only to establish two-tiered pricing, a retail and wholesale, but to enforce the wholesale, to have a venue, to have a channel, to have access to your products at that price. And, and so that for us is, is what Amazon has become or what forlife.com can be for those who just simply want to come in and shop, buy a product and be gone. And so, so it's critical to do that because now, now turning to those five of the hundred who become affiliates, become brand ambassadors, and who, who are looking to, to make this a financial opportunity, what value do they really offer to anybody? And what chance do they have if they cannot offer the best price to everybody that they talk to? I mean, that I can't imagine trying to sell a product that, that I'm, that, that's being sold for something less on the world's largest marketplace. I, I remember when I first uh, started doing some 
some meetings here domestically in the U.S. And I, I you know, I, I get done with my talk and I, I go, I like to walk out into the audience, go to the back of the room, see what it looks like, feels like, and inevitably somebody will come up close to me and just, you know, talk to me, say hi. It was, it was striking how many would say as a part of the, the quick chat, hey, Danny, what, what are we doing about Amazon? And, and I was just, I was thinking to myself, gosh, what, what are we doing about Amazon? What, 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 what is happening with Amazon? Because in my other roles here at, at Forlock, I just kind of had my head down working on operations, doing those things. But it was, it was, it was striking to me how important this was to the rank and file person who, who were going into the homes of people or approaching a friend or a neighbor, whoever it was. And, and, and finding out that they had somebody interested in a product only to be out undersold by Amazon. <clears throat> that, that, can't, that can't be a, a long-term strategy for any company, but especially in our industry where we are relying upon this, this sales force that works with their friends and family on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So I feel like I've talked a lot. I don't even no, know this is on the point right now, but yeah, there's so many, there's so many good points there that, that I want to dig into and, and just continuing with, um, you know, your thoughts around Amazon, it's hard to understate the impact that it's had on every sales channel. Um, you know, it's oftentimes the first stop in the customer journey. They're going to go to Amazon to investigate, to get a sense for pricing, to read reviews. It's the second largest search engine in the world. You know, it's set the standard for e-commerce and, and convenience. It, it plays such an important role. And I think to your point, um, I think it was something that, that, internally and the field was really struggling with in, in direct selling. And I, I think a kind of a, a strategy is forming um, there, but I think the real value of Amazon for direct selling companies is more strategic than it is financial. It's not necessarily, you know, going to be the sales channel that you drive incredible sales volume through. It's there to help position the product. It's there to protect the brand. And that's not just from a look and feel standpoint, but from a quality standpoint, I was at a company where, you know, products were uh, questionable quality, you know, someone would open them and dilute them and, and mess with them. And, and it was kind of the wild west. And there was, you know, 15 different price points as you would go and, and visit the different retailer pages. Um, but Amazon's done a lot, I think, with creating great brand pages, allowing companies to create a great experience. How do you um, at For Life look at kind of those the strategic value of Amazon versus the financial? Yeah, it, it's all strategic. I think you nailed it away. And I mean, for us, it's about it's about being there and protecting our brand and 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 protecting the value proposition of our hundreds of thousands of affiliates around the world. You know, because like you said, that's the first step for most people in that customer journey. I, I was in a meeting in Miami, about 500 people, and we had our top leaders. In the front row and you know kind of i'll say rank and file back behind them and then as part of my presentation i i, I kind of had the guts to throw up a slide that had the amazon logo on there and just say hey we're working on amazon and at that point we've made some really good progress in, in in maintaining and establishing a really strong retail price on that platform and spontaneously i've never seen it before or since and probably never will the rank and file they're on their feet they're erupting in applause it, I mean, that hit me so hard. This was so meaningful for them, just strategically to, to protect that value. Now, the leaders on the front row, they didn't pop on their feet and their heads were kind of down because obviously they they were the source sure. in a lot of cases of, of that product being on, on that on, in that channel. So it is strategic. As long as there's one product in an Amazon warehouse or that they've won the buy box for a, for sell for less than what you've established that price, it's it's bad. It's it's not good for for this for the company for the affiliates. And and you're right. I don't think, and we don't expect, and aren't seeing that that sales on Amazon are, are game changer for for us. It's not the financial side. It's it's about having the the right images of your products. It's about about having the right descriptions. It's about having awesome product reviews. And so the people who do go there, they see a beautiful brand beautiful product images, great reviews, and, and good descriptions. So they're, they're actually shopping, they're learning there. But a sophisticated buyer is going to say, well, I'm going to go to forlife.com or I'm going to search the products mm -hmm. there and see, I might, I might just go to the source of the company or, or of this product and, and, and create a relationship there, which is what we think they'll do. Or they'll go back to the person that referred them to 
the product or the brand in the first place because that person can offer them 20 or 25% off the price that's being offered on Amazon. So Amazon becomes a tool, yeah. if you will, or, or a third-party validation. Like, okay, the product's legit. It's on Amazon. It's Amazon choice. It's getting, you know, four and a half star reviews, 4.8 star reviews, but I can get it from my friend for a lot less and for what's free shipping. And so for us, I mean, it's, it's, it's a must as a part of our strategy in today's world. Absolutely. We, we have to be um, engaging on, on Amazon, owning the brand there. Again, it is so important. And also, um, as you mentioned earlier with the pricing, you know, establishing that retail price that, that provides then the incentive and the motivation, you know, for that buyer who either comes to your website or, or meets one of your, your promoters or distributors. Once you have that anchor of the retail price established on Amazon, it, it is that incentive. It shows the benefits of buying through, you know, the sales member channel, you know, which is again, the, the entire rationale, uh, you know, for the existence of, of direct selling. Um, so tell me, so I'm interested to talk a little bit more about that process and that event. So I'm sure you had some, some pretty tough conversations with some of the leaders prior to that event. You know, you didn't just surprise them or, or drop it on them. How did you get the field to understand the strategic value to their business in essentially removing people from Amazon except the company so that the company, again, could, could show up in the results, could own the buy box, could, could have consistent good reviews, what were those conversations like? Yeah, they, they, they weren't easy. Many of them were, were not easy, but it was amazing to me when, when you really boil it down, there were just, there were not that many of our, of our top leaders that were involved. There, there were some, and they were people that we all knew, obviously, for the most part. And so we, it was about identifying who they were. And so you, you have to know who's buying your products and, and where the, those products are ending up. You just have to know that if you're going to have any chance at, at winning this, this war. Um, but but at our, this was a long process and we went through many phases and, we're, and it, it's an ongoing battle. It's not like we won the, the battle and then we're just sitting back and resting on our laurels. It's, it's a daily thing. It, as we speak, somebody could be right now putting up a four life product on Amazon and listing it for sale. Sure. And it's sure. not that hard to do. But as far as our process went, um, our first phase of this was, hey, Let's identify who wants to be on Amazon or these other online platforms and let's have them sign an agreement saying they agreed to, you know, sell at this price and, you know, we'll monitor this. And if they don't do sure. it, there'll be repercussions for that. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a cooperation with them. Um, but, but that didn't allow us to really own the brand on, on that platform. And so it, it, it eventually got, to, and, and by the way, throughout that process, we were able to identify exactly who was there. So we knew who was there. We kind of knew what volumes they were doing there. And it was a nice symbiotic relationship. But but it, we arrived at the point where we felt like we needed to take more complete control of, of that channel and of, the, of our brand there. And so there were, there were some tough conversations. There were some tears with some people because it had become uh, an important part of, of their business and what they were doing in terms of volume. But we knew we felt that it was the right thing for us to do. So we slowly transitioned transition them out, gave them time to sell out of their inventory and, and uh, help them to get back to, you know, working directly with, with people, with individuals and, you know, where they started doing the business. And we kind of took over that channel and, and in doing so, we've had even more success. In fact, in recent weeks, we're, we're either hitting 100% buy box or we're in the high 99 plus wow. percent buy box for, for Amazon. And, and it's, it's, it's a tribute to our, our team here and to the strategy that we put in place, but also to our leaders in the field who, who bought in on that strategy. And they understand that ultimately this helps them because going back to that meeting in Miami that I described, I was talking about, hey, imagine you go into somebody's home, you're, you're, you're presenting the, the opportunity, you're, you're talking to them about products, and then they leave and you know go to the bathroom and they're checking Amazon on their phone to see what the real price they should be paying. And imagine they find a lower price and they yeah, they raise it. Daddy, no, no, no. They, they check it right there on the couch in front of you. Like this, this was so important for them that they understood they're okay with for life controlling this channel because it does wonders for them. Because think of it, imagine you approach a friend about an awesome product that you believe in and, and you tell them, hey, here it is. Here's everything that it does. It's, 
you know, based on what I know, I think you could really benefit from, from buying and, and, and taking this product. It's $50. And then they go and check and it's $45 on Amazon. What happens to that relationship immediately yeah. versus, versus you say it's $50 and then they still go and check Amazon and it's $65 on Amazon. What happens to that relationship immediately? You know, trust goes up in one and it, and it falls through the floor in the other. So they understand that this is critical to the strategy of the company. They, they get it. It was, it was hard for some who were deeply steeped in this world, this culture of selling on Amazon, but we're well past that now. Well, congrats to you that, that you were able to do it in a, in a really kind of thoughtful way that brought the field, especially the leaders, you know, along and helped them understand how this is really about protecting their business, you know, not, not you know, getting the buy box every time or getting the conversion, I should say. It is about getting the buy box, but, you know, not as much about getting the sale um, and, you know, filling the for life coffers, but it's protecting their business, um, you know, just as much. So if, if the brand experience is all over the place, if the pricing is all over the place, if quality is all over the place, again, it, it makes it even, you know, more difficult for our distributors and leaders to get out there and, and share the products, establish relationships and, and convert customers. Well, you mentioned, Wayne, uh, I, I, oh yeah, I, go ahead. One other important point, and, and I know it's a little bit, uh, you know, maybe uh, controversial or, or, I don't know, taboo, but the, the other benefit is that you've, you've basically now stopped the main, I'll say dumping grounds yeah. for, for product, which is a, a big, it's a, it's a big, I'll say, um, negative aspect of, of our industry. And one of the main criticisms that we're getting and so, if we can prevent and control, you know, this marketplace, it makes it really hard and, and, and disincentivizes people to go out and inventory load or front load it because there's nowhere, there's nowhere to get rid of this product. And so it, it's, it's been an, a critical part for us to be in compliance with our industry standards and to be very, very much aware of where our product is, who's buying it and where it's ending up and, and where it should be ending up is in the hands of consumers who want to buy it and who are benefiting from the product. Absolutely. Um, I love that. And, um, you know, to your point, I, I think that that's how the channel initially viewed Amazon. You know, it was a dumping ground. What can we do to prevent and stop? So it almost became this, you know, role of compliance to track this down and to shut it down and get it off the, you know, the platform instead of now the shift, which, which I know you've led it, for life, but that more and more of us are seeing it as, look, it's a strategic platform for brand building, for positioning, um, you know, for building awareness, for search. Uh, it's something that we have to engage with. Again, we have to participate with. There's, it's not a choice anymore. So if, if any of those, um, you know, companies that are, that are listening don't have an Amazon strategy, you have to get one now. And I would say, look to how for life's done it. Again, I, I think how you've done it is literally textbook. Um, I hate to say that I've tried, you know, to do something very similar and got got shut down. Um, you know, again, we just wanted to clear it up. We just wanted to clean it up to to help manage the the brand and the quality and the entire experience. And uh, you know, I guess timing wasn't right. And so I, I hope that they're still trying to push that through uh, because it is so important to the longevity of the brand. Um, I agree, hundred percent. Amen to that. And and we're not perfect, but uh, and it was it was not easy. And we're still doing it every single day. It's it's something you have to maintain. We're we're weeding the garden every day. But good stuff. Uh, we're happy yeah. with the results. So so you've you, I'll call this your phase one. So for life's phase one of your Amazon strategy is to come in and really clean things up and establish your brand on the platform on the marketplace. Is there a phase two? Is there um, you know a different way that you can engage in the platform that you're looking to? Or right now it's just hey let's make sure that this is completely dialed in. I, if there is a phase two, it's it's not completely defined at this point. Um, enough for me to talk about it today. Sure. I, it's hard to predict the future. I, I think what we've done, we've accomplished phase one for sure. We've, we've come and established the four life flag in, in the Amazon territory and we're, we're there and we're defending that territory. Um, what does the future hold? I, I, I don't really know. Exactly. There's some there's some tweaks we, we may make, but it, 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 again, it's, up, it's about brand awareness. It's about third party validation. It's about it's about helping our affiliates do what they do best. And, and they yeah. are the ones who do what they do best. In fact, I'm convinced that the people who buy for life products on Amazon 
are only buying them because they heard about them from For Life affiliates or, or you know, consumed them once upon a time. And for whatever reason, they lost contact with that person yeah. or they don't know that they can do it easily at forlife.com, uh, which is also a critical part of the strategy. You know, we, we're hoping to turn people back to forlife.com and back to affiliates um, because we want them touching us, right? We we can offer 100% satisfaction guarantee. We we can offer you fantastic service, better service than than Amazon can. And so we're hoping that it's turning people back back to for life. And so that's that's what we'll continue to do. We'll continue to enhance our brand there. Make sure that 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 all that does is serve to um, you know, help our affiliates do their job faster, easier, more effectively. Absolutely. I think you know. Again, any any purchase on Amazon, there is some real intent and real relationships behind it. I'm sure. And and I know that your company and your website um, does everything they can to really connect those two back again. If it was a um, a distributor that had introduced the product a long time ago, and they come back to the website organically now. You guys make every effort to to make those connections again, and I, I think that's really admirable. You mentioned one other thing that I think is really important around the management of Amazon. Um, it needs to be actively managed. It's not someone's job a couple hours a day. It's so easy to to lose rankings, to have things you know get out of control um, on Amazon. So it is important to have it actively managed. Do you have somebody that's full time? Is that under the preview of Brian and your marketing department? Um, how do you handle that from kind of a, a workload perspective? Yeah, so early on, um, we we partnered with some people and we still partner with uh, one company in particular um, that, that you can do it yourself as, as a company. You can hire people that, that have this experience or you can train yourself. I mean, all, all across the spectrum, there's companies that can assist. Uh, one of the first companies we used, in fact, was that guy who took me around introducing me to his colleagues way back 20 years ago in Silicon Valley. His um, name's Trajan Bailey. Uh, started a company called Great Falcon, and they helped us kind of get our arms around how many listings are out there on Amazon. You know, how how many hundreds are there? What, how many different prices? How many different sellers? And so, if you just are feeling overwhelmed and don't know where to start, I would I say look to somebody like that. Pattern is another great company based yep. here in Utah that are just they're fantastic at doing what they do, and I can provide contacts. Uh, but you know, I think it's Pattern.com. Look them up, and they they can help. But but internally, our, our compliance team, they're looking at this stuff all the time. We take full responsibility for what's happening on Amazon. And if we needed to, we could we could 100% manage this at any point. And, and you talk about a phase two, that's probably what phase two would be is where we would manage it completely. We just, we, we're trying to keep a healthy distance between ourselves and Amazon. We're not wanting to get sucked into that retail space necessarily. So we like um, having a little bit of distance mentally and emotionally from that world, if you will. But uh, yeah, we have people looking at it. There's software that you can buy that that shows you, you know, when your product, or your listings are 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 changing. There's tools within Amazon that allow you to to monitor the the map pricing. So it's a whole other world. You you probably want to dedicate at least one really smart person to this who's excited about that and is young, eager, and, and entrepreneurial in nature, because um, I think that's where it will end up. I think each each company of, of, of size will probably have an online sales department that will manage these relationships eventually directly with Amazon, eBay, Walmart, Mercado Libre, and, 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 and I think they'll be working closely with the compliance team because there's, there's the whole issue of, you need to be able to track your products. You need to be able to have a system where you can surveil and, and understand and trace back to what what the what the original source was because the enforcement of your policy is critical if you can't enforce your policy you can't enforce retail price you never will be able sure. to and if you can't enforce a retail price or maintain that 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 value proposition of brand equity then the whole thing falls apart you know back when i came on board we we ourselves had kind of flattened out we're lagging a little bit and there were lots of theories as to why that was happening. My 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 theory is that we were losing the Amazon war because it again, there might be a few people that can benefit from from the wild wild west of not caring and not enforcing what's happening on that world, but the masses, the masses of affiliates and brand ambassadors trying to sell your product and and and, and bring people into the business, they they will become demoralized over time and they will give up. 
So absolutely, it's so vital to be. Sorry, no, right. that. No, no. Don't, I'll ask some more questions. We'll end on a good high note. No, it's it's super important, and and I hope that people go back and and listen to this a couple times and understand what you and For Life have done with the Amazon strategy because I do think it's exactly the way to play it um, for your field. You know, for the consumers. I, I hope they go back and listen to it a couple times. Uh, I know I will. I want to shift a little bit. Um, well, I guess one point I'll make really quick is I, I do think there's really great people out there. Um, that, that you can hire onto the digital marketing team that specialize mm -hmm. in the Amazon platform, that, that understand the drivers and the dynamics, and um, they absolutely pay for themselves, you know, probably even in the first couple of weeks of, of actively managing your Amazon presence. Uh, it's pretty incredible the magic that they can do. So it, whether it's outside with a pattern, who I know a lot of the people there, or you bring somebody inside, it is, it is important mm -hmm. to have that uh, focus and have it be actively managed. So I want to shift a little bit um, to talk about kind of brand. You've talked about the importance of, of protecting the brand as it relates to other channels and from a pricing standpoint. Recently, uh, you went through a rebrand, the first rebrand since 1998, as I understand it. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the decisions and the drivers behind going and updating the, the visual and verbal expression of the brand? And I know it wasn't just kind of surface layer, but you also dug deep and established positioning um, purpose. It was really rooted deep in, in the strategy and the go forward strategy of your company that then informs not just the expression, but product strategy, technology strategy. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the, the motivation and the process of that rebrand? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I have to state that this really started with our founders, David and Bianca Lissenby, and they, they started for life back in 1998 and it's just steadily grown. And you know, for Life is, is a company now where we have offices in 25 markets around the world, and we do business in well over 50 countries. And, you know, we, we, we are, I would say, a pretty unique company in, in this industry, having that track record and having um, just we're being, being a global company of our size. It, it's, it's, it's challenging, but it's exciting at the same time. But, it, but we've been, yeah, we've been in business for quite a long time and they've kind of been knocking on the door of, hey, it's time to freshen things up. And they've been knocking on that door for a couple of years. And, and some of us weren't listening because we probably didn't want to deal with with what that would mean in terms of cost yeah. <laughs> and, and, and work, to be frank. But um, but once we started digging into the process and, and we, we, um, we found a, a really cool consultant that really got... Uh, us and understood where we were coming from. And it was it was important for us to not just work with our internal team because we've got some really cool creative guys and, and team here. And but we also wanted to bring somebody with an outside uh, perspective who had who had a lot of experience in the retail space and, and consumer space. So we did that and we we did some good exercises internally. We we got a, a big group of our team here, management team and we just really delved into what is for life? What is our brand? What does it mean? What, what about the product? What, what are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? What do we want to say to the world? What, what is our persona and our personality as a company? So we went through all those exercises that some people hate and some people just absolutely love. We, we forced everybody to do that and, and it was a good exercise. And in the end, I think what, what we, what we came out with was awesome. It was, it was just what we wanted. It wasn't a, a complete overhaul, but it was an enhancement of, of a brand that had meaning in the industry and, and, and with our people. It wasn't a complete departure. In fact, it stayed fairly close to, it, it looks and feels a lot like the old logo and brand, but, but there's a freshness, there's a newness to it that I think in, in, in invigorates something in, in our team and in our people in the field. And, and it says something about us that we're not stagnating. We're not staying in the same place as a company. We're moving forward into this new world, this new frontier, this, you know, direct selling has changed. It has changed so dramatically much. since For Life first started, but it's changed dramatically in the last two years even. Yeah. And, and this whole traditional idea of, oh, I'm a distributor. I go to the office, at, you know, during the month and I go buy a bunch of products and I take those back and I take them to people's houses. I mean, that that's not even close to what's happening anymore, even though that's what happened in a lot of, you know, Latin American countries, Southeast Asian countries, those, those markets and those countries, they grew up quick. 
you know, they, they are online now. They're, they're receiving packages at home. They're buying online. They're figuring out how to, to do this whole e-commerce thing. Um, older generation, they're figuring out how to do e-commerce and, and that's what's happening. So we wanted to demonstrate and show through our brand that we are also, we've evolved as a company and as a brand and as a company, we're fresh, we're new, but we also were faced with this, this kind of a challenge where we had an awesome name for life and there's meaning behind that. We won't go into the meaning of the name today, but, but we also have our flagship product, which is Transfer Factor, which supports the immune system. But, but how do we get somebody to look at our brand and our logo quickly and understand fast, like what does this company do? And so we, we, we added a, um, you know, a moniker to the, to the logo for life, the immune system company, because we want people to know that in an instant, we're, we're a company that's in health and wellness and we sell products that support the immune system. So it was a great journey. Um, we love where we came out on the other end. It continues to roll out, you know, throughout the world in our offices and through our digital platforms. But it, it's it's beautiful. I love it. I love wearing the logo, wearing the hat, and it's fun to to represent uh, um, our company. It's fun to see how much our affiliates love our brand and they've embraced this. and And it's felt like a rebirth. It really has. Oh, that's exciting. As a brand strategist, I spent a lot of years on the agency side, helping companies kind of go through these processes. Uh, go through these um, evolutions. And it's always great to know and to hear, especially that you approach it from a strategic perspective. It wasn't window dressing, but you firmly established the positioning of the company, as you said, who you are, what you're about, how you're different. And then once you have those anchors firmly established, allow those to inform the visual and verbal expression of the brand, that it's not just about making something look pretty it has uh, strategic roots that it's trying to fulfill an objective and, and function as part of the brand. I also like that you mentioned that it was an evolution. I, I also think that those are the most successful rebrands, evolution versus revolution. Doing a complete overhaul on a brand, I think should almost never be done unless there's something very wrong with the brand. And it could be perception, uh, it could be an awareness problem, but these processes should feel like you. I always call it the kind of the Cinderella slipper. It should just fit. It should feel like you, but a new and a better, a more aspirational you. So uh, I really appreciate that you use the word kind of evolution in there because that's what I think a, a really successful rebrand is, um, just an evolution of who you are. And, and I think it's also important, as you mentioned, all the change that's happening in the channel right now, the consumers and their tastes are changing so rapidly that that in order to remain relevant and to maintain, you know, your leadership position in your product category, I think we have to look at doing this, you know, every two, five, you know, it kind of depends on each brand, but it should be done with a little bit more frequency now, just stepping back and, and re-examining, are we saying the right thing? Are we differentiated enough? Has the competitive landscape changed? I think going through this process is, is really important. Um, and, and I'm excited to see it roll out. It is a process. It takes a long time. And I know that, you know, one of the main functions of, of the CEO and other execs in a refresh like this is just continuing to beat that drum. This is who we are. You know, this is how we're different. This is the difference that we're making in other people's lives. And it can get monotonous and boring to those kind of beating the drum, but it takes time. It takes repetition to really make sure that it um, really enmeshes with the culture of the company and becomes part of it because then everyone at every level understands how they're fulfilling on that brand promise from the CFO all the way down to the person that's answering the phones. What is that brand promise that we're delivering to the person on the other end of that phone? Really cool experience. I, I'm, I'm excited to see it roll out. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's been, it's been good. And, and uh, there are a lot of great people out there who can help with a, a brand strategy. And, and I mean, you being one of the best, in fact, that, I felt good about um, everything you just said there, knowing that one of the people that you work with, who's now on our team, Brian Gill, he was a huge yeah. part of, of this. And I think uh, obviously you mentored him well over the years. And, and uh, so we were able to, to get full company buy-in and, 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 and we actually added an important pillar of value to our brand as a result of this process that came out. We wanted to add satisfaction as being a big part of what we do. And it's amazing how much that plays into the conversations we're having internally 
uh, making day-to-day -day operational decisions. And as we interface with leaders and with, and with customers, satisfaction now is on the forefront of our mind. Like we want to leave, we want these people to leave their experience with us today or the, these touch points being fully satisfied. And, and what company doesn't want that, right? That's how you that's how you establish the brand. That's how you keep people connected to your brand. And so it was a great process. And um, if you're at all thinking about doing this at your company, um, you know, reach out to Wayne and he's got some great ideas and, and there's some good people out there that I could refer as well, in addition to Wayne, that, that could be super helpful in getting you started in the right direction. I'm glad we did it. At first, I had a little bit of yeah, trepidation. Sure, it can life. be nerve wracking. But yeah, congrats on, on successfully going through that process. And I'm glad you brought up Brian. I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Brian. He's an amazing marketer uh, and an amazing human being. Um, worked with him for several years. One of my favorite people literally was kind of that first call as I started in a new company. You and I were talking before, but I just want to give him the on-air shout out. But as I as I went to a startup, uh, he and I, he was literally the first call I made to start building the marketing team. And he and I worked together for several years, just a, a great marketer and great human. Oh, yeah. Awesome. When we were going through the hiring process, we narrowed it down to two incredible candidates, him being one of them. And I just thought, how do we not hire this guy? He's like the best guy I've met. <laughs> He's such a good person. Like we got to have him here. So He's yeah. awesome. His nickname, yeah. this is this is not an exaggeration. His nickname at that company was The Machine. He just would work and work and get things done and, and kind of anything you threw at him. Uh, he would make sure it got done and got done right. So I, I learned a lot from working with him as well. Uh, we won't, Danny, we won't let him listen to this podcast. No, it, yeah, because then he'll get a big head. We don't want that. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> well, Danny, thank you so much for your time. Uh, yeah. It's a topic that is so salient right now, so timely. And again, congrats on how thoughtful and strategic you and For Life have been on the Amazon. Mm -hmm. On from a pricing strategy, I think it's something that that often gets forgotten, but is uh, a strategy, not a task or a, a function. And uh, also on the rebrand, how to successfully kind of bring in the field and, and roll out a new rebrand and a refresh to remain relevant. Thanks for all you do. Thanks for coming on and appreciate all you do in your role for all of us in the direct selling channel as well. So yeah. thanks, Danny. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Wayne. It's, it's been a pleasure. It's, it's felt like just talking to an old friend. I appreciate uh, what you do here. I, I love this podcast. I love this format. And thanks to Stuart Johnson and everybody at, at Direct Selling uh, News. This has just been awesome. So I hope that we've been able to, to share some content today that's meaningful to people and made it worth their, their while to listen. But uh, I've enjoyed the time so much. Thanks again.